Well, good evening. <laughs> I am so happy to see you all here. I'm Ann McKee. I'm the campus minister at Maryland College. I get to say that for four more days. Um, so, in one form or another, since 1876, the Maryland College community has sort of taken a pause in the middle of our ordinary business, in the middle of busy semesters, to stop and consider important questions of faith and justice and the question of how should we live in a very complicated world. Um, the meetings, that they used to call them, the meetings have taken different shapes at different times. Uh, they used to be week-long revival services um, where there was great singing and classes were paused and they kept track of how many people were saved during those meetings. <laughs> Later, they were um, lectures from academic leaders across the country. Sometimes they were guided conversations as the members of the college and the community tried to catch a vision together. Um, for a long time, they were called February meetings. Um, it was kind of a restart in the middle of the year um, to stop and consider where we might be going. Um, Former students would often talk about the fervor and the revival that they felt at this time. A few years ago, when Kathleen Farnham and I discovered that February is a really awful time to try to schedule people to come, uh, ice storms and all manner of things, um, we gave them a new name, the Margaret Cummings Conversations on Faith, Learning, and Service or the Cummings Conversations for short. They are named with much affection for Margaret Cummings, who served for many years on our religion faculty. She taught Bible as a required course for 29 years, between 1940 and 1969. My hunch is some of the people in this room, maybe one of our speakers tonight, took, uh, took Bible from Mrs. Cummings, Ma Cummings as they called her. She led Maribel College's first international study trip to the Middle East. She was the first woman elder at New Providence Presbyterian Church. So the Cummings conversations give us the chance to do what Margaret Cummings did in her life, to think deeply about questions of faith and about the complexities of contemporary life with all the challenges and all the opportunities that lie before us. We are so happy to be in person again this year. Um, and we are so happy to welcome our guests. It feels exactly right that this year um, we convene again to consider important questions of life and death, of medical ethics, of the relationship between our physical bodies, their strength and their frailties, and the society that we live in, the meaning of personhood in this challenging time where over the last two years we've had to consider what is the value of the individual? What do we owe to one another? Um, what does it mean to be a neighbor? We will be ably assisted in these inquiries by two Maryville College alums. They come from different generations. Possibly they have trained and think through different philosophical lenses, and they share a common commitment to respect of persons and to help others live well in society. Dr. Brian Childs, who is the class of 1969, is professor of bioethics and professionalism and Chair of the Department of Bioethics and Medical Humanities at the Mercer University School of Medicine. He earned degrees from Princeton Theological Seminary, and he studied with the modern eth medical ethics founder, Paul Ramsey, at Princeton University. 
earning a doctorate in ethics and moral psychology. He showed the excellent judgment a few months ago of hiring Caroline Anglum, who graduated from the college in 2013, who went on after Maryville to the University of Chicago Divinity School, where she turned in her dissertation this week. <laughs> yes! Um, she is, she'll tell you more, but she's concerned about medical ethics, especially in a context of religious pluralism and democracy. So when she receives, as we know she will, her PhD in religious ethics this spring, she will then join Brian on the faculty of Mercer University School of Medicine as assistant professor of bioethics and professionalism. They will be a great team, and we are honored to have them sort of um, preview their team spirit tonight as they present to us. So they are going to present, and then they're going to talk with each other a bit, and then there will be a question and answer session, and we'll have a mic kind of roaming around in the audience. Um, and then tomorrow, I hope you'll all come back, not to this auditorium, which begins with an L, but to the other auditorium that begins with an L, Lawson Auditorium, which is in the parking lot of Fairweather Hall. And I'll just tell you, because I only have four days left and I can say anything, don't worry about the parking, like we're just going to call security off, and you won't get tickets if you park in Fairweather Lot. Um, I hope you'll come back because I think it's a conversation worth having. Will you join me in welcoming Dr. Childs and Ms. Anglum as they present to us? I don't know if you all remember that, I can't remember if the commercial was, it was Marv Thornberry. I think it was a beer commercial. And they had all these celebrities and Marv Thornberry, who was played with the miserable Mets, the, 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 the team that couldn't win. And he kept on saying, I don't know why they're having me in this commercial. <laughs> <clears throat> Never uh, 50 years ago would I have thought that I would be on this, this stage delivering any kind of message. And so I, it's a... Uh, and to, uh, to be with Caroline is uh, what we Presbyterians used to call providence. <laughs> I, 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 I do want to say uh, one more thing in my gratitude um, to, to be here. Um, I've made friends here at Maryville, and I've, I've kept up with a, a fair number of them. But there's one person that I've kept up with who's going to want to hide right now, and that's Robert John Bonner. He's very grateful that I was never one of his students. But he mentored me, and he watched me, and he cared for me, through all the mistakes that I've made in my life. But he always believed in me. And that's, I'm, I'm eternally grateful to you, Robert John. Let me say something about what we're going to do this evening. Caroline and I, in this session, are going to be more or less diagnostic. We're going to talk about what the condition is that we think there needs to be an answer to, and that we, in fact, have some um, suggestions for answers. Um, but we're going to be kind of diagnostic. What did this, in particular, what did this pandemic tell us about who might be our neighbor, or who have we have forgotten to be our neighbor? Um, and let me just say something very briefly about the Mercer University School of Medicine. We have a mission, and it's very, very clear that our mission is to train 
primary care physicians to serve the rural and underserved persons in the state of Georgia. <clears throat> Just the rural and underserved persons. And I'm very proud to say that 72% of our graduates, in fact, are serving the rural and underserved persons in the state of Georgia. And I'm <clears throat> so <clears throat> um, these are, you know, the, the grand challenges of rural health uh, are resolved through, you know, education, research, community engagement. 85% um, of our graduates this year um, are going into primary care, which we define as internal medicine, family practice, OBGYN, pediatrics, psychiatry, general, uh, and uh, general surgery. Uh, and now we're adding uh, emergency medicine. Okay, how am I going to advance these? Is it this button? Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So let me, <clears throat> this pandemic kind of changed the rules of our game, but we realized that we didn't have the rules that we needed to have. You see, what we do have been traditionally doing is training our clinicians, uh, and by that I would include physicians and nurses uh, and other persons, including chaplains, um, who are involved in healthcare, um, we've been training them to deal with the individual. And what the pandemic showed us was that we had to, so we had a medical ethic that was pretty much uh, focusing on the autonomy the, of the individual, the respect for the autonomy of the individual. But the pandemic kind of blew that apart a bit. Um, and this caused a fair amount of, of distress because we didn't have what it appeared to be an adequate public health ethic uh, that could address the problems that we were facing in this, in this pandemic. Uh, so we had folks who had a difficult time shifting from the patient-centered practice um, to patient care guided by a, a public health ethos or, or ethic. And so what medical ethicists did was they immediately started worrying about triage. That is, how are we going to dispense finite resources that's with overwhelming need? And so we, what the medical ethicists started doing was dusting off old triage policies that we had when we had the H1N1 threat and the SARS threat in the, in the 90s. And so what we were anticipating is what this, this chart will show you. We were anticipating that we would have to develop ways of distributing finite resources into whom were they going to get those resources because we were anticipating an onslaught of need and are not capable of, of answering to all of those needs. So we, you know, we had stuff, space, and staff. As we moved to greater, greater need, we started realizing that we were using emergency stockpiles. We were expecting that we weren't going to be able to give everybody ventilator support, for instance, which is a primary concern with, this, with uh, COVID. Um, and then also, we were running out of, of medications and even oxygen. So this, 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 you know, we, we, but we were dusting off this model of triage that some of us began to realize assumed an anthropology, if you will, of, of, of a kind of person who one had access to health care um, and who was reasonably healthy. So that persons who didn't have access to health care or who had a deficit uh, of, uh, for some reason, in their health we're at a disadvantage from the very beginning in qualifying for the triage policies that were developed. And then this is what the healthcare workers were experiencing. 
the, the, the strain of some of the, um, we were, we had to stop having visitation policies. So there were no visitations. So people who were dying in our hospitals, their loved ones couldn't be with them. And so the, the stress, not only on the families, but also on the healthcare workers who were trying to mediate, maybe through um, media, we were using laptops with FaceTime uh, so that loved ones could at least be somewhat close to the, their, the, their loved ones who may be dying. We had, <clears throat> we had women giving birth and their partners could not be there uh, for the birth because we had limited uh, visitation policies. This illustrates some of the conversations. Uh, these these uh, graphics are by, a, a, as you can see, a physician. So here are some of the, the, the reflections that I had, and, and Carolyn's going to pick up on, 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 on some of her own. <clears throat> I want to just go through these weaknesses that I, I, I'm seeing now in our national health care delivery um, and some of, of these other related areas. The COVID-19 pandemic for sure revealed really a plain truth. And this is a quote from the New England Journal of Medicine. We can no longer afford to operate in silos. Um, this is, in fact, a once-in-a-lifetime public health crisis that really demands a level of cooperation that our healthcare system hasn't had. Um, and what we discovered in, in, in our institutions, that we weren't prepared for this kind of thing. One of the things that healthcare organizations do is they have just-in-time purchasing. Other industries do this as well, but we had no stockpile. And a lot of our material was coming from overseas. So the pandemic, we was a supply chain problem. So that we would have uh, people in the hospital without personal protective uh, equipment, you know, face masks, bunny suits, uh, because we didn't know how infectious this, this uh, virus was. We also in medicine have focused primarily on rescue medicine. That is where um, we are concerned with the critically ill, not in so much in preventive care, but in, in the critically ill. Also, most of our healthcare organizations are dependent upon a profit margin. Whether you're a for-profit healthcare organization or a not-for-profit, there still has to be a profit margin in order to keep things operating. And what did they count on for those profit margin? was elective surgeries. So when we couldn't do elective surgeries, our organizations were faced with financial collapse. Um, we, you know, we needed to have uh, far more public discussion. And we also saw the discussion move from, uh, do you remember when we hit pots and pans uh, and to celebrate the healthcare workers? But then it became politicized. And sometimes healthcare workers were not seen to be trusted. Nursing homes, we don't take care, we, with the healthcare crisis showed the weakness in how we take care of, of those who are uh, chronically ill uh, in convalescence uh, or in the aged. So 25% of the deaths in New York City were in nursing homes, 81% in Canada. Why? They didn't have the PPEs. They didn't have their personal protection uh, devices um, because the acute care hospitals got that so that we had persons working in these organizations unprotected um, and, and so, you know, that created really the, increased the infection rate. Um, Health care disparities, which is what we really want to spend a, a good deal of time talking about. Um, across the country, uh, African Americans died 
at 50.3 per 100,000, compared to uh, 20.7 for whites and 22.9 for Latinos. Um, in Georgia, you all may remember the epicenter was in, in, in um, Albany. They, it's Albany, not Albany. Albany. <clears throat> and it was two African American funerals. Um, and that was the epicenter for this country uh, for, for infections and deaths. Um, we, our triage policies were based on uh, a, a, a kind of a, a baseline of persons who had access to health care. Um, so those who were disadvantaged actually got less points in our triage policies um, for um, getting ventilation, oxygen, and, and then some medications. So what we found was that our triage policies were actually normalized on whiteness. And what can the epidemic teach us? Uh, uh, what can the history of em epidemic teach us? Um, and I think that's happening to us now. Um, we are asking really very important questions about civil liberties. We're asking very important questions about uh, mortality. We're asking very, I think, need to ask more important questions about who is one of us and what are our obligations to them. And how should we teach and practice medicine? Um, are we going to lose our touch? Uh, we were, I was speaking to some friends at dinner this, this evening about telemedicine. Um, and do, do, at Mercer, we, we are training our, our medical students to do the touches, um, to, to, to be physical. Um, but the pandemic has is, is, is created a, a new ethos in, in medicine that's you know, telemedicine and distance medicine. And also the other thing that we really struggled with when we had to shut down our clerkships was how do you teach young persons to be physicians when they can't touch their patients and hear their stories? Carolyn. Thank you, Dr. Childs, for that insightful talk and really for your reflections on your experience during the pandemic. Um, and thank you to Anne McKee and the other organizers of the Cummings Conversations for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back on campus. I learned two things about myself in the last 20 minutes or so. One is that it's a little weird to stand on a sta sit on a stage and <laughs> listen to someone else talk. And the other is that w Dr. Childs and I have very different presentation styles, so I'll be talking from notes. Um, so please forgive me. Um, so I thought in offering a response to Dr. Childs that I would um, kind of have us look in two directions. One, um, I would have us look backward to think a bit about the uh, principle of autonomy and how it came to dominate the conversation in modern American uh, medical ethics. Autonomy is important in this discussion because it's a guiding principle in medical care. And as we think about how to align our um, guiding principles in medical ethics with this new information about social determinants of health and social and political inequities, um, we have to do some reevaluating to figure out sort of what needs to give um, in those principles and um, what needs to be adjusted in order to make space for that sort of previously overlooked information. And then second, I thought I'd have us look um, forward in a way um, and sort of apply this, what we might call a socially active approach in medical ethics to a few other cases. Uh, and we're excited to hear questions and comments from all of you about cases maybe that are on your minds and um, other ways that you might think about applying uh, some of these concepts. So we'll start by looking backward uh, so that we can evaluate our guiding principles in medical ethics. Uh, to do that, we would need to know a little bit about the history of the field of medical ethics and uh, a bit about where some of these guiding principles uh, came from. So to answer that question, we could go way, way back, well before antibiotics and uh, organ transplantation to really the fifth century BCE, think uh, Hippocrates. 
uh, but we won't go <laughs> quite that far. I think the period of change that's really most important for this conversation is one that's much more recent. Um, so this story takes us back to sort of the middle of the 20th century in the United States. Uh, at this point in time, doctors were very powerful actors in their uh, practices, of course, but also in their communities, in the lives of their patients. And they had enormous power over what they told <laughs> or did not tell uh, patients, over um, what treatment options they presented to patients, over how they responded to patients who uh, maybe made requests or refusals of uh, treatments. I think you can see that really well in these two Rockwell paintings. Uh, the one on the left is this sort of cheeky painting of this recalcitrant little boy who's getting glasses against his will. It's sort of a doctor's no, doctor knows best painting. Um, the, one on the, um, the one on the right, uh, you can see it in how the um, parents are clearly deferent in their engagement with the doctor. They're sort of hanging on his every word. If we move that timeline forward into the 60s and 70s, events like the Civil Rights Movement, the Vietnam War protest, uh, the Summer of Love, right, led to a kind of reckoning of public uh, figures, everyone from priests and politicians to military officials and doctors came under public scrutiny. But in the case of doctors, it wasn't that um, medicine um, was seen as unimportant or their work was seen as unimportant. It was really that they started, the public started to question whether doctors were um, qualified to make really important, even life-altering decisions on behalf of patients. Um, the public had started to see the, um, or become aware of the moral quality of some of the medical decisions, especially around the use of certain biotechnologies. And so they had questions about uh, the authority of doctors to navigate that space. So in that context, uh, the old style of doctoring, the Rockwell <laughs> style, um, where the physician had a lot of power over the patient, came to be called paternalistic. Paternal, of course, has a gendered quality to it, so alternatives have been introduced, like parentalistic. Um, but these terms are used to critique those doctors who function as the sole decision makers in the medical encounter. Uh, sort of like a parent would be the sole decision maker for a child. So as you can see in this informatic, uh, communication in the paternalistic model is unidirectional. On the other side, those who rejected paternalism in, in medicine felt that patients should be well informed and provided with you know, as many opportunities as possible to make decisions for themselves. They came to be known as anti-paternalist and really, in the end, they won the day. Um, anti-paternalist, the anti-paternalist approach is um, represented in the bi-directional exchange of information and values and in shared decision making. And if you've been involved with medical care in the last 40 years, you've probably experienced <laughs> the anti-paternalist uh, approach. So with the help of the burgeoning human rights discourse, this is like post-World War II, um, the anti-paternalist movement um, effectively birthed what they called the principle of respect for autonomy. And by the late 1970s, that principle had sort of risen in power to become the central ethical construct guiding medical practice and research. Autonomy can roughly be described as uh, the promotion of patient self-determination and informed consent. Um, and the principle of autonomy is often talked about in medical care in relation to a few other principles. If you were in Dr. Child's uh, presentation this afternoon, you heard already a quick synopsis of these principles. Um, but those three are uh, beneficence, which is basically the physician doing what's best for the patient. Non-maleficence, <laughs> which is uh, do not the principle of not harming the patient. And then justice, which kind of gets thrown around in a lot of different ways, but typically is referring to some kind of um, distributed justice of resources and institutions. But it's autonomy that rules the day in a lot of medical ethics discussions, keeping coercive kind of old style paternalism at bay. And it shapes practices today um, 
around shared, sharing information, truth telling, confidentiality, um, advanced directives, healthcare, POAs, lots of uh, different kinds of policies and practices. Um, so in the past 40 years or so, several really important critiques have been made of this prioritization of patient autonomy in healthcare. For example, um, physicians sometimes critique the prioritization of patient autonomy when they feel that it minimizes or undervalues or misuses uh, their own expertise. Typically, this critique focuses on those cases in which um, patients or families of patients, probably more often, request aggressive treatment at um, any cost or uh, when they request particular kinds of treatments that the physician thinks will be ineffective. In these cases, physicians sometimes feel like mechanics or technicians brought in to serve the goals of an individual patient. They often feel that it turns healthcare into a commodity rather than a communal good, um, which is why this critique is often linked up with data about um, the exorbitant healthcare costs in this country. While there are overlaps between this critique and the one that Dr. Childs presented, um, I want to differentiate them for you in an effort to sort of crystallize the problem at hand. So in this provider critique of autonomy, um, the issue is really about the confusion of the principle of autonomy with an unqualified right to choose. The patient gains so much power as a consumer of health care that her every whim is indulged. Um, note that in this version of the critique, the provider critique, the patient has access to healthcare. She's likely experienced in navigating the healthcare bureaucracy, and frankly, she expects that her wishes will be taken seriously. Um, the patient in this provider critique is a highly privileged patient, and the claim being made about autonomy is about reining that privilege in. In the context of the pandemic, however, the contestation around autonomy has been a bit more global uh, in scale than the one that I just articulated. Now the claim is that our incessant prioritization of patient autonomy has poorly equipped us to understand the social, economic, and health inequities that have conditioned and perpetuated deeply unequal health outcomes especially across lines of race and socioeconomic class. This critique comes from the perspective of a patient who feels that our picture of the autonomous patient, right, the perfect autonomous patient, does not match up with her experience. It even obscures the ways in which her decisions in medicine are conditioned by her life experience or life situation. Things like her occupation, daily nutrition, insurance status, the frequency with which she can pursue well-visit checkups, uh, her management of chronic illnesses, her baseline functionality. Each of these aspects of the patient's life impact her health, not only the decisions she makes in the hospital, but the very options that are made available to her when she experiences health emergencies or acute illnesses. So when we see patients as autonomous decision makers when they enter the hospital, they're sort of fabricating a sort of sterilized cross-section of a life and not thinking complexly about how the singular experience in the hospital relates to, and it indeed is only fully comprehensible within, all the other experiences of a person's life. These complexities reveal that autonomy is really not available to everyone in the same way. Um, so Dr. Childs already mentioned some of these numbers, um, but I wanted to say that the insufficiency of the sort of concept of the, this purely autonomous patient has been thrown into sharp relief by the pandemic. Um, Recall that uh, some numbers that I saw from the fall said that this, uh, the CDC had reported that nationally black, Latino, and Native American persons were between one and a half and two times more likely than white persons to be hospitalized for COVID-19. And on this slide, um, in the bar graph on the left, oh wow, those are very unclear. <laughs> I'm sorry. So in the bar graph, I'll try to describe it. In the bar graph on the, on the left, 
the three, uh, so the bar at the very top that's long is, um, represents Native American population. So this is in relation to 100,000 people. Um, and then uh, hospitalizations. And then the three long bar graphs in the middle represent Black, Latino, and Native American, and Pacific Islander populations, respectively. And then the very short bar at the bottom represents the white population. So that gives you kind of some, some way of thinking about um, these numbers. Although these numbers reflect the experiences of individuals, they're collated here to show how patient care is predicated on layers of risk and vulnerability. First, race and ethnicity are known risk factors for experiencing social ills like poverty, unemployment, lack of access to health care, and exposure to the virus for occupation-related reasons. And second, each of these social ills are known risk factors for hospitalization and death by COVID-19. So that makes clear that the historical injustices tied to race and ethnicity impact survival likelihood in the COVID-19 pandemic, which is why, as Dr. Childs argued, survival likelihood is a problematic measure when we are establishing triage protocols and resource distribution policies in our institutions. With this measure, we risk perpetuating cycles of injustice and harm that predate the pandemic and indeed have shaped its course. This example shows also why we must attend to social determinants of health in our discussions about the ethics of particular cases and the ethics of general protocols or policies. To put it maybe too casually, our hyper-focus on, aut on autonomous decision-making in medical ethics is sort of like rearranging furniture when the house is on fire. The protection of patient rights depends not simply on our ability to protect the patient's voice or decision-making capacity, it also depends crucially on our ability to understand and respect the patient's positionality and to evaluate the burdens that our protocols or practices put on that patient because of compounding inequities. The social sort of position and power of our patients often inform the very decisions they are faced with, the options that are made available to them, and even the amount of respect they are afforded in making those decisions. And so I think it's the responsibility of medical ethicists to take stock of those factors and how they map onto larger patterns. So I guess in addition to sort of diagnosing the problem in medical ethics where maybe we've missed um, some of our neighbors in need, our constructive proposal for medical ethics is something along the lines that we see our patients as our neighbors, that at a minimum um, we see our patients as minds and bodies marked by advantages and disadvantages that are interacting um, with the public good of med medicine in ways that have deep consequences for their medical, social, personal, economic futures. This lens or way of seeing patients disrupts the kind of neutral, isolated, autonomous caricature of a patient that we've concocted in principle. Um, so now I wanna shift my comments and um, offer a, an alternative case. I was gonna say two, but maybe I'll leave one for Q&A in case people have questions. I'll just leave it out there. <laughs> um, so, um, I, I think that this case might help us think about how this way of, you know, approaching medical ethics could be applied to other kinds of cases that are non-pandemic related, uh, lest we think that that's, you know, the only place where we apply this sort of approach. Um, so I'll have to be schematic about this, but um, might be of interest to a few of you. Uh, so, as many of you know, Hurricane Katrina devastated several areas along the Gulf Coast in August of 2005. It's hard to believe that's been almost 20 years. The effects of this natural disaster were compounded by bureaucratic ineptness, ineptness and, uh, and then made worse by already failing public health structures. In downtown New Orleans, over six feet of water flooded the city, even well after the storm had passed. This case is about what happened at Memorial Medical Center, which you can see underwater in the picture on the right. At Memorial, there were patients, um, medical professionals, family members, even survivors from the street who uh, sought refuge from the storm 
Many of them were in the building for several days, living in horrendous conditions, suffocating heat, no power, no water, um, backed up sewer lines. They, these were very dangerous conditions, especially for ill patients and, uh, and exhausted staff. So on September 2nd, um, the last of the staff were evacuated from Memorial, and I should say well after staff and patients had been evacuated from the city's private hospitals. And then nine days later, on September 11th, 45 bodies were removed from the facility. Most of these individuals were known to have died from the illnesses that brought them to the hospital, um, and some from heat and exhaustion in the days immediately following the storm. But in the case of four of these individuals, the Louisiana Attorney General ruled the deaths suspicious. These individuals were patients in a long-term uh, care facility leased by a Texas company called Life Care. And I think it's important to point out that many of these patients were poor, elderly, and black. And while some of the patients on this floor had DNRs, which are do not resuscitate orders, um, many expected to go to rehab or to return home after their conditions stabilized. So their illnesses were serious, but not immediately life-threatening. These four patients, um, of course, were thought to have been euthanized by staff members on the floor, which eventually led to murder charges being filed against a doctor and two nurses. This action, in my view, sort of came to grotesquely be termed um, mercy killings in the media and in much of the literature because these patients were seen as incredibly vulnerable and unlikely to survive. The staff uh, who were charged with these crimes argued that the standards of medical care should change in emergencies and that informed consent may not be possible in the wake of a natural disaster of the scale of Katrina. So Carla Holloway, who's a historian and a literary theorist, um, has written quite a bit about this case and I think in a fairly compelling way. And she's argued that the status of the patients on the life care floor as vulnerable and unlikely to survive, we've heard that before, uh, can only be understood in relation to the myriad of ways in which Katrina exacerbated persistent disadvantages. We know, for example, um, that it was the most disadvantaged populations in New Orleans who were the last to be rescued, if they were rescued at all. So in this case at Memorial, she thinks that any justification of euthanasia as merciful or compassionate is utterly inattentive to how the prospect of death for these patients mapped directly and predictably onto their vulnerable identities, which of course are not identities that they chose for themselves. Right? The bigger point is that um, although euthanasia is often talked about as terms of this radical autonomy uh, for the patient to decide for herself what will come of her body, and sometimes in terms of the sort of tragic beneficence of the physician in reducing the patient's suffering. Those principles do not capture the texture of this case or what makes it morally reprehensible. What happened on the seventh floor of Memorial simply cannot be understood and evaluated ethically without telescoping out to the histories of neglect and disadvantage that ensured that it was this particular group of people in this particular place who were victimized. Our ordinary ways of talking about autonomy, um, or even justice sometimes, are structured by a certain picture of a privileged patient. And so when the patient before us doesn't match that picture, we have to find ways to adapt those operative principles and think more capaciously about the justifiability of our medical ethics decisions. It seems that in uh, this case in particular, rescue medical ethics created the possibility that some people would not be rescued at all. I had thought I would do another case, but we're just, I don't want to cut our time too short, so I'll just dangle that. If you want to talk about drug, <laughs> drug shortage related cases, I'm happy to um, talk about it in Q&A. Um, but for now, um, I, I think we'd like to turn to questions, and I want to go ahead and plug that we would love to get questions from the audience and just hear what you're reflecting on or thinking about um, and let us kind of think with you on those um, questions and reflections. Um, but to get it started, we thought we would um, play Oprah and ask each other questions. <laughs> 
Um, so I'll ask the first question to Dr. Childs, and then I'll, I'll sit down. Um, could you maybe think with us a bit about another case, perhaps from your career um, or that you're aware of in the literature that might have benefited from this socially active approach to uh, medical ethics? Yeah. Thank you. It works, right? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> I, was, I was born in New Orleans and when my father was a medical resident at Memorial Hospital. Uh, this is well before Katrina. But uh, after Katrina struck, um, I was a Red Cross um, a mental health uh, uh, worker. And uh, I, I left uh, my wife, Ashley, who is here, um, to try to get to New Orleans. <clears throat> I was not able to get into the city um, so they put me in Biloxi, Mississippi, in Gulfport, um, which is, as you know, just um, east of, of, of New Orleans, which actually had more deaths in, in that area than um, in, in New Orleans. And what I saw there uh, was the, the, the devastation, the, 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 the tidal wave that went into Gulfport went exactly a half mile inland and wiped out entire neighborhoods. So people would escape, and these were, the poor, these were poor neighborhoods back from the shore. And um, it was, it was, it was, it was you know, I called Ashley nearly every day with, with you know, stories of, of um, the, the devastation. But <clears throat> people could not leave and they're the ones that suffer. Um, we had we had um, uh, we we had no way to distribute um, insulin for for people who are diabetic. And guess what? For those persons who are underserved uh, and medically, are also persons who are living in food deserts. And uh, hyper diabetes and hypertension uh, is 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 a is a chronic problem. So they're at a disadvantage in the first place, and then they couldn't get their meds. Uh, it, so it was it was really quite dramatic, and and um, and demoralizing um, for uh, those persons who were trying to 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 rescue and then um, um, to to uh, reinforce and find them places to to live and get their meds. One plug though. There was one healthcare organization that had their act together and was able to get medications, particularly psychotropic medications to their patients, and that was the VA. The VA was remarkable in being able to find their patients and get them their meds. It was, it was really quite remarkable. Well, I, I could probably, I could talk about cases, I, I do rounds in, uh, at our academic medical center three days or four days a week now uh, with cases that came out of COVID. And I could probably go on forever and, and I won't. Uh, but, but I would like to ask you a question and then hopefully we can get some questions from our, our guests here. Um, there's a lot of folks that don't trust the, the, the medical profession and, and that includes uh, not just physicians but also other healthcare workers. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about uh, where is autonomy and also as it plays in whether persons autonomously trust our healthcare profession and wh why might that be? Yeah, thank you. Um, one thing maybe I should say um, just to to be clear about autonomy, just for the audience, is that um, the reality with the autonomy is that it means that patients can make suboptimal decisions, and that can be very burdensome to um, physicians and other healthcare workers. It can be um, sort of feel tragic and, and, and whatnot, and, but, but that is you know, a reality of um, respecting this principle of autonomy. Is it, once we sort of ensure that a patient has competency and is able to make a decision, a reasoned decision, you know, in view of all of the potential outcomes, uh, negative and, and, and whatnot, um, 
you know, we, we have to allow that they can make those decisions for themselves. Um, but it, that um, sort of very clear example of autonomy is often complicated by a few factors. One is this issue of competency. Um, one thing that maybe those who haven't spent a lot of time in, in the halls of medicine might not know is that competency is the kind of thing that has to be reevaluated constantly in, uh, in a medical care context because you know, all of you probably have known people who have entered a hospital and with good um, medical care and nutrition, suddenly they're, you know, they get to a point where they're able to make decisions for themselves when they maybe weren't when they first came in. The opposite is also true, of course. Illness takes hold or perhaps medicines are described that are prescribed in which um, you know, the, the person's competency sort of falls over the course of admission. So that's something that always has to be sort of monitored. That's made, that's sort of complicated even further by this issue of trust. Um, you know, when a physician lays out maybe a set of options and encourages a patient, um, you know, toward a, a particular direction, the patient might be inclined um, to think that the, the physician doesn't have their best interest at heart if there's this, like, relationship of trust isn't already established. And so I think on that front, um, there's a lot of work that has to be done on the part of the physician much earlier before a disagreement, a kind of crisis disagreement occurs or before a discharge um, is sort of imminent um, to establish that trust. A lot of that comes with the virtues of humility and sort of respect and empathy and curiosity um, to help patients feel just heard and respected and, um, and like they, you know, uh, can be in a relationship of, of trust with the physician. Um, probably in moments of crisis when they're, um, when this sort of issue of trust seems to come up, there are maybe a few tools in the toolbox, you might say. Um, one is that a physician might um, encourage a patient to get a second opinion and offer a referral. Uh, they may encourage a patient to take some time <laughs> to think about decision if that's an option. Um, they, they may encourage a patient to bring, you know, their family in and have a kind of private goals of care conversation. So there are some things um, that physicians and other medical care providers can do to try to reestablish that trust if it's been broken or lost over time. But maybe you have thoughts as well. I, I had a, had a briefly that <coughs> we had a. Uh, our hospital is a, is a trauma center, so we get a lot of really beat up people. A homeless person who had been beat up by a lead pipe was brought into our trauma center, and they called in the, the neurologist, and they called in, he'd, he'd been beaten about the head, so they called in an ophthalmologist that he had an eye hanging from a scenery from his eye socket. And they called in a plastic surgeon, and they called in an orthopedist. And they, they, was, they were all arguing about who was going to take care of this person first. And none of them wanted to take care of this person. But there was a chaplain who was there. And the chaplain looked at this man and said, what is your name? Any, any questions or comments or anybody wanted to add to this? this? So you've talked about two decision makers being the physician and the patient. What about the third, at least in some cases, which is the insurance company? So... Oh. I thought you were going to say the family. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's, that's exactly right. You know, medicine is a commodity. That's, what, that's, that's how we're using it. And so a commodity is, is it's, it's, it's a matter of, of, of bartering or, 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 you know, you pay for what you, you get. Interestingly, this pandemic showed us that the persons could afford the health care needed the health care the most were ones the ones who couldn't afford it and two 
who couldn't rem work remotely at home. They had to get on public transportation. They, in fact, were cleaning the rooms at our hospitals, the lowest paid persons, uh, and exposing themselves in, in the hospital because they had to clean the patients. So, yeah, the, the commodification of, of healthcare is, is, is a problem. And, 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 and currently, in, this, in the way we deliver healthcare, and, and we're really the only first world um, country that has medicine primarily as a commodification. And, and, and not something that, that may be a basic human right to basic health care. Uh, yeah, that's, that is just increases the problem. When we have this rescue medicine dependent upon, you know, the uh, elective surgeries. Yes. I wonder if you might speak to the concept of autonomy versus perhaps the concept of the tragedy of the commons and how far autonomy might go to harm the entire society as a whole. If you, if you follow where I'm going with that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think one thing we have to be careful about with autonomy in um, well, one of the reasons that aut autonomy has come to sort of dominate the conversation is that we don't, we, we generally feel that um, patients shouldn't be expected to sort of give up something, um, give up an option because they think someone else also needs it. Um, and there's some level of sort of division between individual patients that, you know, autonomy is meant to protect so that patients aren't faced with that sort of um, decision. Um, but kind of going back to the issue of insurance, um, you know, that's in its own way a tragedy of, <laughs> of the commons. They are sort of, those who are not insured are in many ways faced with these kinds of decisions. They maybe aren't giving up something for someone they don't know, but they're giving up something in their family. Um, you know, I, uh, I see Doug in the audience. Before I went on to University of Chicago, I worked with Habitat for a year, and many of the people who go through Habitat have a lot of medical debt, an incredible amount of medical debt. Um, or, you know, there are other reasons, but that came up all the time. It really stuck with me. Um, so these decisions, are really complicated for people. I think that's part of what I was um, you know, trying to, to point at, is that they're not always decisions that are just about biology, right? They're often decisions that are social and they're economic and they're familial. We had a case um, in the fall of a, a man who um, had an injury at work, a machinery injury at work, and um, had two or three fingers um, amputated. And, um, they could have been saved, that you know, there was a certain amount of time and ability to sort of preserve them and the clock was ticking and he had decided to sort of get them um, reaffixed and then, um, and then he started thinking about it. <laughs> and uh, once he started thinking about it, he thought about all of the therapy, all of the additional surgeries, the potential that he would, you know, never be able to use that hand again, that it would have decreased um, uh, uh, mobility and strength. And he sort of started thinking about his family. And, you know, I think he just decided in the end, like, I can't, I can't do this to the, it wasn't about him and his fingers. It was really about his kids and his wife and his coworkers. And he was like, I, I I'm just, going to leave them off. It's easier for me, you know, economically and socially and personally to just move it on, you know. Um, so those kinds of decisions happen all the time, but they're a little smaller in scale maybe than what you're thinking about. Uh, Brian, I'm Michael Barrows, class of 1971 here, so we were here for a couple years, so about 50 years ago. 
given what we've discussed here as far as commodification and insurance and all that, what do both of you see as the evolution of this over the next 50 years? The center is not going to hold. If we continue delivering medicine the way we do now, it's going to collapse. Um, I, 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 I think that with this, I think this pandemic in particular um, is, is really a wake-up call about how we're going to take care of um, our neighbors. Um, and <clears throat> the, the person I studied with at, 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 at uh, Princeton in, in ethics was uh, this marvelous theological ethicist, Paul Ramsey. And um, he, he, he would say the real critical question of medical ethics, of any ethics, is this. Who is one of us, and what are our obligations to them? And I think that's really a question in medicine that we have to really be, take very seriously. Is one of us anyone, is it, is it, is it part of our community, strangers, who we may not know, um, but are still somehow neighbors and always in need. Um, can this, can our medical profession or the way we, it's not so much the profession, it's the structure and the organization, the way we deliver medicine. Um, are, is, it, is it capable of really addressing um, our brothers and sisters who are in fact in, in need? And I, the way we're structuring it now, um, it's, it's, there's going to have to be, a, I think, a really a major revolution. Um, it's not going to be as easy as health care for all. Um, it's because that's going to be very painful if, if that were to be an option in this country. Um, but certainly the way we deliver it now. Our hospitals, particularly our rural hospitals in Georgia, are closing because they cannot sustain in the economic uh, 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 milieu uh, keeping open um, because the you know most of the critical care goes to the the, the larger uh, urban hospitals so the the, the the rural hospitals can't support themselves with the they don't get the the, the um, Medicare and Medicaid funding which all hospitals depend upon so I'm, I'm not terribly optimistic um, but I know that there's people smarter than me. Um, there's a lot of people smarter than me. <laughs> but they're going to be working on this. And it's going to be the younger persons who are going into medicine who are going to say, we will not do it this way any longer. That I'm counting on. You know, one thing that we haven't spoken a whole... We, we've thought a, a bit today about... Um, the burdens on the patient, but we haven't spoken too much about the burdens on the physician or on other medical care staff. And I think the pandemic has made some of those burdens much clearer, um, the sort of moral burden and, and maybe also just uh, sort of the, the physical burden, the burden of like work-life balance, those kinds of things. So uh, as someone who has a sister who's a physician, I'm hoping that that's something that changed, that that conversation sort of continues and um, and is able to, to gain some momentum because I think it has to be addressed for medicine to stay afloat and, uh, and be productive and 
You know, I think that's certainly the case. Really, the, the, the only religious communities that uh, support health care now are, is, is Roman Catholic. And, and, and even those uh, hospitals are, 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 are being bought out because they, they can't sustain themselves. Um, and that, that's something that, that we're going to talk about tomorrow. But um, one, of the, one of the problems, I think, with medical ethics, um, secular medical ethics, um, is, is that there's really no basis for its authority. And um, I, I think that's, that's a, what that means is, is that medical ethics becomes kind of levelized to almost quasi-legal deci decisions, rather than important decisions that Professor Ramsey would talk about. What does it mean to be one of us? And what are, what are our obligations? What does it mean to be a sister or a brother or a neighbor? Those are the kinds of questions that, that you know, I wish, um, remember we have Presbyterian Hospital in New York City, but it's, it's certainly not Presbyterian anymore. You know, I really wish that we would retrieve, um, you know, that uh, the, the, the ethic that I think that a, a theological or religious ethic has, a, has, has some kind of an, an authority usually scripturally based. Um, and, and I would, I'm going to be arguing uh, tomorrow uh, based on, on the great commandment. You're to love God with all your heart and your mind and your soul, and the second is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, th that, that has legs. Uh, Laura, did I... A lot of my work is on religious pluralism in medical ethics, and so I'm a little less familiar with the history of that uh, transition, although you're correct that it is sort of changing dramatically or has changed dramatically um, away from sort of faith-based medicine to um, more of a secular medicine. And so with it has come this kind of turn to secular ethics. And so I'm a big proponent of, you know, the religious, religious voices being part of the conversation or voices at the table, you might say. But maybe one point I can make um, is that um, I think the conversation can't look like this. It can't be like, okay, we're gonna get one person from the Presbyterian Church, and we're gonna get one person who's Jewish, and we're gonna get one person, you know, like we're gonna get one representative from all the different churches, and they're just gonna already know what each of their, you know, congregations or, you know, institutions would say about these issues, um, you know, new or old or whatever. It doesn't really work that way. It's a much more, in my mind, it's a much more kind of constructive and dialogical sort of process. It's not like, oh, if we all come together, we can just agree on something. <laughs> uh, but that's often the way it's, it's sort of thought about in secular medicine, that somehow if we just have a Congress of all of these voices, we'll somehow land on something. Um, that we all agree on, and, and I just want to maybe warn against that. I don't, I don't actually think that that's how it works, although you know, I would be a strong advocate nonetheless for religious voices being part of it, because really uh, there are a lot of, as we've said today, a lot of religious and social issues that bubble up in these moments of conflict in medicine, um, and that help resolve some of these conflicts in medicine, um, so they need to be part of it. But we have to learn together, in a way. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we can hear you, I think. No. Sorry. Uh, so I'm struck given what you were just saying about the importance of a, um, a religious grounding for an ethic. Um, I'm struck by what you said earlier about uh, the United States, which is far and away seemingly the most religious of the developed economies, is the exception in not having universal health care. And uh, an emphasis on public health and that kind of sort of base level accessibility. It's not that 
other countries have solved accessibility or equity, but that seems to me sort of like a, a pretty fundamental difference. So um, that, perhaps you could just speak to that. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I don't know that I have much to add to that. I think it was a point well made um, in the form of a question. Um, yeah. What do I want to say about that? <laughs> uh, certainly, you know, it seems... To, to me, it seems that um, there's a lot more that we could do for public health care. And uh, in fact, the conversation we had earlier about the VA is probably as good of an example as any, you know, that the, that of all the health care systems that were successful during, you know, the chaos of Katrina, the VA was pretty successful. Um, you know, I, I guess it's hard to know in this country exactly what role religion has in, um, in advocating for that, but religion has had a role in advocating for a lot of public change <laughs> and uh, civic change, I guess. Um, so, um, you know, to the extent that religious voices are willing to sort of reach across the aisle, so to speak, and um, make a case based on principles or um, commitments that or maybe not as uh, partisan. <laughs> Perhaps there's there's some hope on that front, but there's a long way to go, as you pointed out, and um, not as many clear examples. At least, certainly there are examples of good healthcare systems in the world, uh, but maybe not as many as you were suggesting that map on to our exact kind of political and religious. Uh, context, so it makes it challenging. I'd, I'd like to make a just a, a brief comment about that question. Uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, um, if we think about those countries that have universal health care. Uh, they are also countries that have had tend to, tended to have had state churches, uh, so they had a they didn't have the religious pluralism to deal with uh, when they made uh, uh, decisions, political decisions about health care that that the United States have, has. In the case in Germany, for instance. Well, Germany, Switzerland, the, the Scandinavian countries, um, uh, Britain. Even. I, I I'd like to ask a. a smaller world question, um, and, it, and it has to do with uh, uh, how we get uh, physicians and patients to talk about autonomy or to talk about how they make decisions uh, together. Um, and I'd like to hear your comments about two words that uh, I have heard you, t both of you say, one of you, at least one of you say, and one of, one of them is humility. Uh, how, how do we teach, hum can we teach humility? Um, and how do we make humility part of our ethic? And the other one that I hadn't thought about before, uh, which you mentioned, was curiosity, uh, which seems to me equally important. How do we make, how do we teach people to be curious? Uh, the example of the, the chaplain who said, what is your name? That's a question that, that comes out of curiosity um, rather than mechanics. So, that's my question, statement, whatever. Mm -hmm. There's a, a significant growing movement in, 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 in medicine. It's called narrative medicine. Um, and uh, one of its, its leaders is a, a woman that I actually uh, spent some time with when I had a, a, a fellowship with the National Endowment for the Humanities, and a physician by the name of Rita Sharon. And, and she was quite interested in, in those two questions, humility and, and, and um, curiosity. 
And one of the things that she would say is that our patient is basically a stranger. They come to us as machines. And what, what physicians really can do is to ask them their name or to really to, to be that they don't really know near enough about their patient if all they know is their mechanics. That they, they have families, they have stories, they have narratives that when they come into the doctor's office or into the hospital, it's one of the things that I, I tell my medical students is when your patient comes to you in crisis, their narrative is broken. And, it's, and you need to be curious about what, what the consistency of what their, their narrative or their biography was, because that's elemental to your ability to heal. And you're going to be ignorant. You have to realize that you're ignorant about your patient until you get that curiosity to hear the narrative and how then you might facilitate healing, if possible, and, and certainly, certainly care. Can it be taught? It's darn hard <laughs> to teach it, because I have a, another colleague that's going to be one of Caroline's colleagues whose uh, her expertise is in, in virtue ethics. And one of the real questions is, can you really teach virtues? Um, or, or is it something that they really if you're lucky, de develops with age. Um, the, those, those are really, really important questions. But yeah, curiosity and humility. I think I, I said this afternoon in, in the lectures. Those are really two things that are really difficult to institutionalize. Mm -hmm. um, maybe one way that um, we've sort of tried, I guess, over the last few years to institutionalize that into shared decision-making is through goals of care conversations. Um, so the way these work, often in, often this happens at end of life, but not, not always. Um, you'll sit down with the, the family members and the patient, and you'll really talk about um, what are our ultimate goals here, and what are the appropriate proximate means <laughs> to get us there. Um, and that requires, you know, some humility to know that you, the physician or the, the medical care provider, may not have the same goals as the patient and the family. Um, you may not have the same values, and um, the kinds of things that you would prioritize are just simply different from what the patient would prioritize. Um, and, um, and, and then sort of shows some, some curiosity on that front, and it gives, provides some space for patients to sort of mark out that future for themselves um, and then help them see the steps that would be required to get there. In fact, that kind of conversation is often useful in cases of conflicts because sometimes the disagreement is happening at this proximate level and the goals are the same. So it's trying to establish like what is it that we do agree on and how can we get you there um, in a way that you know we both agree uh, is it makes the most sense or it's going to most likely achieve that end um, is really important. So um, yeah, I think those are two two ways in which we can kind of institutionalize those those virtues, you might say. Yeah. Thanks. Um, building on that a little bit, you had talked about trust uh, in the relationship. And I was reminded how short a period of time the healthcare provider has with a patient frequently. And uh, one of the ways to try and combat that, I think, has been the emergence of this uh, concierge concept. But my, my feeling about it is that it's probably only used in the much more affluent areas. So I, I just wondered your thoughts on that. Certainly during the pandemic, uh, concierge medicine has kind of really come, come, um, become more popular and, and even through telemedicine, concierge medicine has sort of found its own space um, through telemedicine. So, um, you know, it's, in some ways it's, it's a helpful reminder that that, that is a preferred way <laughs> for patients to experience medical care. Um, but I want to say that you know some of what we're um, suggesting here 
uh, wouldn't necessarily require the physician to become an expert in, you know, religion and theology. I mean, I think we're imagining, or, or, or you know, um, social systems or something along those lines, I think we're imagining that this is a sort of interdisciplinary, multi-person team kind of effort in much the way that medicine is today, uh, um, interdisciplinary and multi-person team effort. Um, but perhaps that team is a bit more um, diverse than, um, than, than, t than we might typically assume and, um, and interested in the patient sort of at a different scale or scope than previously um, thought about. Yeah. In office practice, you, your physicians, you need to get 12 minutes with the patient mm -hmm. and get the next one. And, and it, isn't it interesting, too, that um, we've, we've entered a third party, not only insurance, but we now have this phenomenon called the medical scribe. So you have the physician, the patient, and then the scribe who is, who is, who is taking down the, the data and the information. Uh, it, it's 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 really quite an interesting phenomenon. Uh, or you will have the physician in the physician's office who's looking at the in electronic medical record uh, and 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 not at the patient. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know the, the, the you can see how trust can be uh, diminished with, with that kind of yeah. And concierge medicine is is yeah, I, I agree with you entirely. You you got to be able to afford it. Um, do we increase? Do we increase uh, the, the number of, of medical schools? Yes, um, but we also, at the same time, don't have enough residencies to train our medical students. It's so mm -hmm. it's all sorts of really um, serious problems that we, we really need to to address. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. I was really pleased, uh, Dr. Charles, when you brought up the, the you used the word commodity. Nobody's said the word dollar that I've heard. I'm hard of hearing, but I haven't heard anybody say dollar. And it seems to me everything comes down to the dollar. The medical school, and I, this is a tangent, but I know a young doctor and also young lawyers. who were very disappointed when they got to med school, when they got to law school, when they heard their professors say, this will be a good case for you. You'll make a lot of money on this one. And the same thing about this operation. And those, when they were young, they're, they just shuddered to hear that. That isn't why they entered medical school. That isn't why they wanted to be a lawyer. But it's behind everything. And it's why the disadvantaged don't have regular doctors, so there's no context when they get in the office or in the hospital. They can't possibly know them. You know, they are a machine. So, but I'm, I'm interested in what goes on in other countries. I have a friend in, and what we could do to be more like them. Not, not all countries are as dollar-centric as we are. I admit that. So as you said about something else, it's a really tough question and it's discouraging as we look ahead. But in, I have a friend in France, in rural France, doctors can, the doctors make house calls. Nurses come after minor surgeries to make sure that your bandage is put on right, what have you. I'm sure you know a lot more about comparative medicine worldwide than I do, but where is it done right? Are you giving me all the hard ones? Yeah. Thank you. It's because you're in the loop here. Oh. Yeah, I don't. Um, I don't know enough about. Maybe this is back to the earlier question too. I I don't know enough about how 
medicine works in other countries to speak, you know, um, thoughtfully about where they do it best. Um, but I will say that the the issue of, of of the dollar of money is just a persistent issue in medical care decisions in this country, and it's I think it adds to the sort of moral distress and burden on on physicians in in many case cases. Um, I was just telling Dr. Childs about this case um, where a, we had a, a patient who um, was here on a visa and then um, really was at the end of her life and needed, you know, I think to, to go back to Mexico where she was from and, and be with um, her family. Uh, she didn't have anybody who was able and willing to take care of her in the United States. And the doctors really felt like you know, more than, than the medical care that she could get at the University of Chicago, she needed family and support and that sort of thing. But it sort of turned into this whole question of like, can, you know, will she have adequate medical care in Mexico? And, and, and you know, on what conditions can we send someone, you know, back to their home country? And, um, and I, I thought it was interesting that so many physicians felt like they had no medical care in Mexico. They do indeed have hospitals in Mexico. <laughs> um, and they can take care of patients who are dying. And, um, and so that was a really, it was a, kind of a learning moment, I think, for people to realize that um, that health care would be more affordable for her and it would you know, have better support systems uh, for her. And in this particular case, not in all cases, but in this particular case, it made sense to you know, pay for a medical transfer back to her home country, um, and I would say not some no small part of that is the fact that um, there are more medical resources. Uh, that there's less of a question of who pays and um, who supports in in Mexico. So, um, yeah, I think there's a, a lot to learn from probably many um, countries. Certainly, some of the European and Scandinavian countries uh, have just exceptional healthcare. We could learn a lot from them. So thanks for bringing that up. The less money. The less money. Yeah. yeah. This is too much fun. But we get to do it again tomorrow. So I hope you all will come back, bring your friends, tell your students. Um, one o'clock, Lawson Auditorium. Don't worry about the parking. Security will ignore your car. And um, I promise, just for an hour, we'll talk to them. Um, and thank you. It's in the basement of Fairweather Hall. So if you park in the big parking lot, in, there's a building that's not very well labeled from the parking lot side, but that's Fairweather Hall. There's some signs to admissions. You could pretend that you were coming back for college. And then you just go down the stairs. If you need an elevator, you go to the other end. On the inside of the campus, there's an elevator. Um, but anyway, you'll find it. It'll be fabulous. You all have heartened us and you have troubled us um, and we are grateful for both of those things and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you all.